Hi everyone, CJ here. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Water Margin Summarized series. In the previous episode, we covered how the Liangshan bandits waged their war and the rise of their organization. But with fame comes challengers who will try to topple them. Will they be able to defeat the latest crop of challengers? In this episode, the 108 outlaws will finally be assembled and they will fulfill their destiny. For historical and cultural context, I will also talk about prophecies and predestination in ancient China. By the way, before we start, let me talk to you about the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. Using NordVPN, you can easily change your region and you can access timeless classics that are only available in certain areas. Akira Kurosawa's movies, like Rashomon for example, are only available in Japanese Netflix. Besides access, NordVPN also shields you from snoopers and all kinds of cyber attacks by hiding your IP address and encrypting your traffic. The desktop app even has a new feature, threat protection. When you switch it on, it protects you from malicious websites, malware, trackers, and intrusive ads even if you are not connected to a VPN server at the time. If you use my link, which you can see here on screen and the description section below, you will get the exclusive NordVPN deal with 4 extra months for free. Each account can be used across 6 devices and it is risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. If you are still unsure, you can visit their website to learn more about how VPNs work. Anyway, back to the episode. Obviously, Sung Chang had to go and teach these upstarts a lesson. But wait, Cao Kai stopped him. He will go instead, and no amounts of reasoning or pleas could stop him. As we know, Mount Liang is not a den of simple-minded jolly cooperators. There are actually quite a lot of internal conflict, and Cao Kai was obviously jealous of Sung Chang's achievements. Even when his banner broke on his departure, which was a bad omen, he did not cancel his campaign. Unsurprisingly, his desperate attempt to regain relevancy turned out to be his downfall. While waging war with the Cheng family, he was gravely wounded by their combat instructor's poisonous arrow. Thus, the Liangshan bandits had no choice but to retreat. On his deathbed, Cao Kai proclaimed that the one who captured the Cheng family's combat instructor, Si Wen Gong, will be the new leader of Mount Liang. Well, this is obviously not going to be an easy task. Si Wen Gong was much more competent than they had ever expected. This is going to be a very hard task, and they couldn't even imagine the amounts of subquests they need to do in between. Not long after, they heard rumors of a very powerful warrior called Lu Junyi who could defeat him. So they decided to recruit this man and Wu Yong volunteered to do the job by disguising himself as a fortune teller. In ancient China, Confucian scholars hated superstition, but that didn't stop the emperors and many of the common folks from believing in prophecies and fortune telling. I think we can divide prophecies into various categories, eschatological, omens, and the more mundane fortune telling. Eschatological or apocalyptical prophecies exists for different sects of Buddhism and Taoism, but each sect may have their own version, or none at all. Many Chinese Mahayana Buddhists believe in the Maitreya Buddha, the future Buddha who will bring back Buddha's teaching after it is forgotten. But the number of believers of each sect is limited. That's why China did not have a coherent vision of the apocalypse unlike societies dominated by monotheistic religions such as Christianity and Islam. Omens and signs, on the other hand, are quite common. Confucians do not reject them outright, or at least they just record in the history books what was popularly believed. Liu Bang, the first emperor of the Han Dynasty, was recorded to have been conceived after his mother dreamt of gods and his father saw a dragon floating above her. At the birth of the first emperor of Song Dynasty, Zhao Kuangying, it was recorded that there was red light in the room, mysterious fragrance, and his body was gold in color for three days. These kinds of miraculous births are not limited to emperors. Other important people were claimed to have had them too. 
and it usually means that the child is destined for something greater, whatever it is. Then there are also normal fortune telling, and fortune tellers may read your fortune through your palm, face, time of birth, or other means. Ancient Chinese believe in predestination, but at the same time, they believe that their fate can always be changed. Like Lu Jingyi, for example. He was fooled by Wu Yong into thinking that he would experience a disaster in the near future. And to prevent it, Wu Yong made him write seemingly innocuous passages on the wall and told him to stay somewhere else until the disaster is averted. But obviously, that was a trap because as he passed by Mount Liang, he and his steward were captured by the bandits. They treated him with courtesy. But someone respectable like him can't join the bandits, of course. So Song Jiang let Liu Junyi's steward, Li Gu, go a few days earlier before releasing him too. Later, when Liu Junyi made his way home, he was surprised to find his trusty servant, Yan Qing, reduced to begging in the streets. Apparently, Li Gu had been having an affair with Liu Junyi's wife and kicked them out. The master of the house couldn't believe this until he went home and was arrested by the officers summoned by Li Gu. Wu Yong had fooled him into thinking that his master had agreed to join the bandits and the innocuous passage had a hidden meaning. If you read the first character on every line, it says that Lu Junyi rebels. So Li Gu used this opportunity to betray his master and anti-art him. Okay, now that the chain of traps is completed, Lu Junyi had become an outlaw. He would have no choice but to join the bandits. All they had to do now is to break him out of prison. But this task turned out to be a lot harder than they thought. Some of the Liangshan agents were even captured. But since they bribed the guards, their friends would be safe for a while. To subdue the bandits, the government sent Guan Sheng, the fictional descendant of Guan Yu, the famous general from the Three Kingdoms era who also happened to be his spitting image. Which is great for me, because I get to recycle my old asset. Predictably, he and his lieutenants were defeated and recruited by the bandits. Suddenly, in the middle of the campaign, Song Jiang was warned by Cao Kai's ghost of an impending calamity, and he fell sick. Luckily, Zhang Sun knew a good doctor, and after completing his side story, he recruited Dr. An Daoquan and Wang Ding Liu along the way. Once Song Jiang was cured, they took a covert approach to rescue Lu Junyi and infiltrated the city. This time, they succeeded, and Lu Junyi get to have his revenge on his steward and ex-wife. The government retaliated by sending the fire and water general against them. Guan Sheng was tasked to let a contingent against them, while Li Kui went AWOL because they won't let him be part of the fun. Somehow, this big baby of a man recruited some outlaws and helped the battle by destroying the enemy base. The enemy generals then surrendered and were then recruited. Boy, that's a lot of side quests to avenge Cao Kai. Anyway, after all this distraction, the Liangshan bandits finally launched their campaign to avenge their former leader. Wu Yong tried to give Song Jiang an edge by giving him the best position to capture Si Wen Gong so that he could become the leader. But he gave it to Lu Junyi instead because he wanted him to be the leader. For some reason, predictably, Lu Junyi captured Si Wen Gong and they ended up recruiting their enemy's fast rider, Yu Bao Si. After executing Si Wen Gong, Song Jiang was about to give the leadership position away. But Lu Junyi himself and all the other bandits protested. He was just a newcomer. He couldn't be the leader, Lu Junyi said. To appease everyone, they will settle this with a final contest. Each of them will conquer a city and the faster person to do it will become the official leader of Mount Liang. As if it was predestined, Song Jiang won the contest and recruited the enemy general, Dong Ping. He then moved to reinforce Lu Junyi whose progress was stalled by the rock-slinging enemy general Zhang Qing and his lieutenants. After they were defeated and recruited, Song Jiang finally became the official leader of Mount Liang, and at the same time, he had also gathered all 108 stars of destiny. This is a cause for celebration! As they gave their thanks to the heaven, the Taoist Gongsun Sheng 
was tasked to request a divine sign. After a few days of prayers, a portal from heaven opened up and a tablet shot out of the hole. On it was engraved the position and rank of the 108 stars, the 36 heavenly and 72 earthly stars. So they renamed their assembly hall to the Hall of Loyalty and put up a banner with the slogan, To Do Heaven's Will. As the mystic lady of the ninth heaven had told him, their task was to eradicate evil and defend the country from external and internal threats. But like every Chinese prophecy, the message was very cryptic, and there wasn't a clear instruction on how they should go about doing it. However, Song Jiang's got an idea. Hey, you know what? Let's surrender to the government. What? what? Obviously, this plan caught many by surprise. Li Kui and Wu Song were fuming. This sounds like a major plot twist in the story, but if you caught the foreshadowing, you would know that Song Jiang had planned this all along, and it was foreshadowed since he wrote his so-called seditious poem. Huang Cao, the rebel he mentioned in it, was the man who brought the collapse of Tang Dynasty. But throughout his rebellion, he was constantly trying to negotiate amnesty from the government, all the way to the end. When the empire is weak and faced by multiple threats, the dynasty often negotiate with the rebels. They would pardon the rebels' crimes and incorporate them into the imperial army to help them fight against the other threats. When Song Jiang wrote that his achievements will eclipse Huang Cao, it did not mean that his rebellion will succeed. He actually meant that he will successfully gain amnesty from the government. Part of the reason why he treated Marshal Su well previously was because he wanted to negotiate an amnesty directly with the government. It is also possible that he tried to make Lu Junyi the leader because the latter had better social position and the emperor may grant some amnesty more easily, since Song Jiang was just a lowly clerk in comparison. Luckily for Song Jiang, he was gifted with a silver tongue, and he managed to convince the other outlaws to go along with his plan. Except for Li Kui, who remained unconvinced. Li Kui almost got himself executed for insubordination. But Li Kui being Li Kui just keep getting away with everything. This internal fiction would last until the next major story arc. In the meantime, Song Jiang uses his downtime to visit the Lantern Festival in the capital with his entourage. He's even got a doctor, An Dao Quan, to burn away his penal tattoo with acid, symbolizing his turn into a reformed man. While he was there, Cai Jing saw a warning notice of the four most dangerous bandits, Song Jiang to the east, Wang Qing to the west, Tian Hu to the north, and Fang La to the south. Here is your foreshadowing of what was to come. Cai Jing cut out Song Jiang's name from the list symbolically and handed it to his leader. But this trip wasn't all about pleasure. Song Jiang used this opportunity to build a relationship with a courtesan who was the emperor's secret mistress, Li Sisi. She turned out to be one of the few rare women who's portrayed positively in the novel. They developed good rapport, but the emperor's sudden visit to his mistress through the secret tunnel cut their conversation short. The bandits comically hid in the corner of the room and debated whether they should ask for amnesty now. But before they could make up their mind, Li Kui, who was waiting outside, stirred up trouble by picking a fight. And as a result, the capital was thrown into chaos and they had to send a contingent to save them. This led to a side adventure with Yan Qing and Li Kui, who were separated from the main group. As it turned out, Yan Qing was quite proficient in wrestling and won a Xiangpu contest. Pronounced in Japanese as Sumo, it is debated whether this Song Dynasty Sumo is related to Japanese Sumo. Maybe the Japanese just used the same kanji word to call their indigenous wrestling tradition the same name. Li Kui then met her family who claimed that Song Jiang had kidnapped their daughter. Without verifying anything, he returned to accuse Song Jiang of kidnapping an innocent woman. But as it turned out, the kidnapping was done by an imposter. After saving the girl, Li Kui was so sorry for his mistake, he never doubted Song Jiang again. Meanwhile, in the palace, the emperor finally decided to get some business done. This is the first time he will do any work in a month. 
and he wanted to deal with the Liangshan bandits after the trouble in the capital. But since they had the Kitan Liao dynasty attacking their northern borders, the ministers argued that it would be a better idea to grant them amnesty and let them deal with the Kitans. However, the four villainous ministers and eunuchs, Cai Jing, Gao Qiu, Tong Guan, and Yang Jian, had developed grudges against the bandits, and they will do everything they can to sabotage the deal. They sent their own men to accompany the envoy and behaved very rudely to give the bandits a bad impression. But not everything was their fault, because the imperial decree itself was quite rude. The emperor demanded the bandits total submission, or else. To make the matter worse, the gift of imperial wine was secretly drunk by one of the outlaws, and it was replaced by cheap wine. So it was really everyone's fault that the first offer failed disastrously. Now the evil ministers have the pretext to send their army against them. But this actually suited Professor Wu Yong's designs, because being ever cold and calculative, he knew that they won't be given a good deal until they wipe out a few battalions of the imperial army to show the lowlife that they mean business. He is like the sinister Mr. Spock of the group. The eunuch general, Tong Guan, sallied forth against the bandits and he was defeated. They captured him, treated him with courtesy, and sent him back just to rub it in. Also, because they wanted to stay on the government's good side and negotiate another treaty. Then it is Gao Chou's turn to lead an expedition against them. The Big Bad, one of the main antagonists of the novel. But still, there is no way he could match the united might of the 108 outlaws. Thus, he was defeated easily twice. So he tried to get back at them by doctoring the second amnesty offer by the emperor. He changed the terms, saying that only Song Jiang is accepted from the amnesty to drive a wedge between them. But the outlaws refused the deal outright and shot the messenger. No way will they ever abandon their leader. A third battle was fought between Gao Chou and the bandits, and this time Gao Chou himself fell into the hands of the bandits. He was treated well too. Anticlimactically, Ling Chong and Yang Zi, who had long-standing grudge against him, only stared at him menacingly. In some adaptations, they added more drama here, because this part in the original version is kinda weak. Eventually, they released Gao Chou so that he could negotiate an amnesty with the emperor, and he was watched over by some outlaws. But after a while, they still didn't receive any news from him. So they sent Yan Qing and Dai Zhong to investigate what was happening, and also to arrange a meeting with the emperor themselves. Yan Qing used their connection with the courtesan Li Sisi to arrange a meeting with the emperor. She agreed. And since Yan Qing was quite a fine specimen of a man, she also wanted to... Not wanting to ruin their grand plan, Yan Qing used the cruelest way possible to end any possible romantic entanglement. He sibling zoned her by making her his sworn sister. This is one step worse from friend zoning, because as sworn siblings, they have to look after each other, while at the same time, it killed any possibility of any romantic relationship between them because it would be considered incest. After explaining everything to the emperor, it turned out that he was not informed of Kao Chiu's failure at all. From now on, he will investigate this affair personally. They also contacted the honest official, Marshal Su Yuanjing, to advocate for their amnesty. Finally, they retrieved their comrades who were put under house arrest by Kao Chiu before returning home. With all the dominoes in place, the bandits finally achieved their goal. The emperor berated his corrupt officials and offered a full pardon to the Liangshan bandits. Not only that they were completely exonerated by their leader, Song Jiang and Lu Junyi would be given official posts once they reported to the palace. Well, there you go. Our heroes are outlaws no more. But this doesn't mean that they have atoned for their sins and fulfilled their destiny. This is merely the beginning of their path towards atonement. On the next and final episode, the 108 outlaws will fight to fulfill their destiny. For cultural and historical context, I will also cover redemption in Chinese culture. 
be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it. Remember to check out the link to our sponsor in the description section below. Before I go, I would also like to thank our patrons at Patreon and other contributors for making this series possible. Until next time, stay cool my bros.